Welcome to the first lecture in module two entitled Mammalian Reproduction. So in this video, I'm going to be covering the highlights, just the highlights uh, from chapter nine, which is entitled Reproduction. So our overarching objective today is to analyze the anatomical, physiological, and developmental differences between the order monotremata, the infraclass metatheria, uh, specifically the marsupials, as well as the infraclass theria, the placentals. On the left, we have a jelly bean sized newborn kangaroo joey. Uh, which is in the mom's marsupium uh, suckling on a teat. And then on the right, uh, we have a lion cub that is in utero and being nourished by mother's placenta. So with that, let's dive in. So let's begin by recognizing that the mammals are going to vary greatly in the structure of their reproductive systems. So first we have the monotremes or the prototheria like the duck-billed platypus here on the bottom right and the spiny echidnas. We've got a species here hatching on the bottom left. These guys are going to lay eggs and incubate those eggs. And as in the case of most reptiles and birds, the monotremes have a cloaca. That is to say, just a single urogenital opening. So a single opening for both their urinary and reproductive tracts. Additionally, as in the birds, the monotremes only have uh, one functional ovary, only the left ovary functions in the monotremes. They do have mammary glands, <laughs> but no nipples. The marsupials, or the pouched mammals, like the monotremes, have a cloaca, that is to say, a single urogenital opening. The marsupials do indeed have a placenta, but relative to the eutherian mammals, their placenta is very inefficient. So this means the marsupials only have a very brief gestation period when they're in utero. And then they're born altricial, meaning they're born very underdeveloped. They're going to emerge from the cloaca, very, very tiny, and then they're gonna crawl around to the marsupium or the pouch where they're going to be nourished by milk during a very long lactational period. On the bottom left, we have a newborn wallaby. You can see it's very, very small and underdeveloped. And then on the right, we have uh, one that's considerably more developed and it's just hanging out uh, half outside of mom's marsupium. And lastly, of course, we have the eutherian mammals, like you and I. So these are commonly called the placental mammals. So they're called this because they have this highly sophisticated placenta that facilitates very efficient respiratory and excretory exchange between the maternal and fetal circulatory systems while the fetus is in utero. So unlike the marsupials, the placental mammals are going to have a relatively very long gestational period when they're inside of the uterus and a relatively shorter uh, period of nursing or lactation. So it's flipped from the marsupials. Furthermore, at birth, the young placentals are considerably more developed. They're more precocial, uh, at least relative to the marsupials. Your textbook brings up a very good point early on in the chapter that I think is worth noting here. And that is, it is incorrect to assume that lineages that have a relatively more primitive reproductive system, so i.e. the monotremes and the marsupials, are somehow less successful or less evolutionarily fit than their more derived placental cousins. So I want you to consider the Virginia opossum. 
So this species originated in South America, and yet in a very short time, the opossum has spread from South America, throughout Central America, throughout North America, all the way up to Ontario, Canada. So it's very successful. The opossum has an unusually fast life history tempo. So it's going to live fast, breed early, and die young. So both the female and the male opossum are going to become sexually mature during their first year. Following parturition, you're going to have 4 to 25 pink-skinned, hairless, and blind young that are the size of honeybees emerge from the cloaca and move into the marsupium to begin lactation. So these young are really small. They weigh 0 0.13 grams on average and are only about 13 millimeters long. Most opossums survive to breed for only one year. Their average litter size is about seven, um, and they have two breeding seasons in a year. So this results in uh, a lifetime reproductive output of up to 14 young per female. So this reproductive potential, high reproductive potential, yields a very high per capita growth rate, a very high lambda, which has allowed this species to thrive and spread. This strategy works. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty uh, anatomy, really quickly, I just wanna take a, a moment and highlight some of the truly just mind-blowing variation that we see in mammals with respect to reproductive strategies. So gestation, the period of time that the fetus is in utero is going to range from <laughs> zero days in the monotremes, because of course they lay eggs, um, to a mere 10 days in the uh, dasyurid uh, marsupials. It's a family of marsupials, also known as the marsupial mice, although, of course, they're uh, not truly mice. They're very small marsupials, just a mere 10 days to uh, up to 22 months in elephants. Similarly, the lactation period is also highly variable. So the hooded seal here on the bottom left, this little pup is only going to nurse for four days. Whereas the chimpanzee here on the bottom right, she will nurse her young for two and a half years. Litter sizes typically vary between one and 15 young in the vast majority of mammal species. But meadow voles are incredibly fecund capable of producing nine litters of five to eight young per litter, which equates to 72 pups per female per year. But the record litter size is our uh, beloved naked mole rat pictured here. It's a highly unusual lineage. The colonies consist of sterile workers and only one fertile queen who can produce litters of up to 28 offspring at a time. Let's begin with some basic anatomy with the male reproductive system. So the testes are the male reproductive organs. They produce the male gametes, the sperm, as well as the primary androgen, testosterone. The testes are housed in the scrotum. Like in our fish ancestors, the testes develop in the chest cavity, next to the heart, actually. However, during fetal development, the testes are going to migrate posteriorly and ventrally. And then after birth, they're going to drop down into the scrotum in primates, carnivores, like you see here in these African lions, as well as in the hooved mammals, the ungulates. This is likely because the abdominal cavity is simply too warm for the production of sperm, for spermatogenesis. 
In some bats and rodents, however, the testes will descend each breeding season as needed, and then at the end of the breeding season, they're retracted back up into the aguinal cavity. And then finally, in the monotremes, some insectivores, the anteaters, tree sloths, armadillos, the sirenia, those are the manatees and the dugongs, as well as the seals, whales, elephants, and hyraxes, the testes are always in the abdominal cavity. So if you think about it, some of these species have relatively lower metabolic rates. So think sloths and anteaters, while others like the seals, the whales, uh, the manatees, the dugongs, the duck-billed platypuses, they live in cooler aquatic environments. Spermatogenesis occurs via meiosis within the seminiferous tubules inside of the testes. The sperm is then stored in this coiled tube called the epididymis. From here, sperm moves into this part of the tube where it straightens out the vas deferens. Sperm is then emptied into the urethra where it's combined with other secretions that are generated by the single prostate gland here as well as the seminal vesicles here and the cowper's glands here. Some species have a, a coagulating gland which produces a substance that creates a copulatory plug which can actually last for up to two days and this copulatory plug is going to ensure the retention of the sperm within the reproductive tract as well as block entry from other competitors sperm. So natural selection really begins at the cellular level. Mammals unlike bony fish and amphibians have internal fertilization where the male is going to directly deliver the sperm to the female's reproductive tract internally via the penis. So interestingly, the penis may include a complex bony structure, the os penis or the baculum. So on the bottom left here are photos of various baculum from the short-tailed weasel here all the way up to the impressive uh, raccoon. Here we have uh, the baculum on a red fox. And then check these crazy morphologies out. Uh, these are this bone, the os penis. In, um, on the top left here, these are various ground squirrels. Uh, these are rice rats. They look kind of like tridents. And then these two are bears, and that's a seal. Next up, we have the anatomy of the female reproductive system, which consists of a pair of ovaries. The ovaries produce the egg. It's then released into these oviducts, also called the fallopian tubes. The egg travels down the fallopian tube and is then released into one uterus or two uteri. Uh, the uterus is this large, hollow, muscular chamber, and this is the site of development, of uh, fetal development. And then we have the cervix. The cervix is going to connect the uterus to the vagina, and lastly, the vagina is the opening to the outside of the body. The primary reproductive organ of females are the ovaries. These are a pair of small oval bodies that lie slightly posterior to the kidneys, and they produce the female gametes, the eggs. The eggs are called the ova, which is the plural. The singular is ovum. So immediately under the surface of the ovary is a thick layer of spherically grouped cells, which are called follicles. The follicles here. Each one of these follicles encloses a single egg. 
So at birth, large numbers of follicles are already present in the female mammal. So there's about 2 million follicles that are present in the ovaries at birth in humans. But that number is going to steadily decrease with age. So ladies, your eggs were already within your follicles at birth. And those eggs, they are precious, unlike sperm, which is energetically cheap. So ovulation is induced by high levels of luteinizing hormone, which is going to cause that follicle to burst open and liberate the ovum into the fallopian tube, the oviducts. The ruptured follicle is next going to fill with yellow follicular cells and become one of the yellow bodies in the ovary, also called the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum is really important because it's going to promote the production of the hormone progesterone. And progesterone is what's going to cause the thickening of the uterine lining and the development of the endometrium. The endometrium is going to allow for the implantation of the fertilized egg. Progesterone is also going to stimulate the growth of those mammary glands. It's important to recognize that reproduction is truly a carefully coordinated dance. And it's coordinated by hormones. Hormones are the chemical messengers of the endocrine system. So to summarize, here are the ovaries, the primary female reproductive organ. The ovaries are going to produce the hormone estrogen. Estrogen is going to stimulate the hypothalamus located in the brain to produce gonadotropin-releasing hormone. That's going to signal to the pituitary gland to release both luteinizing and follicle-stimulating hormones. And then we're going to enlarge the ovary here. Uh, those two hormones are going to pr uh, promote the growth and maturation of the follicles. The follicle is going to burst and release that single enclosed ovum, the egg, into the fallopian tube. And we call this ovulation. It's actually within the fallopian tube that the sperm and the egg fuse. And then we have the diploid state, which is called a zygote. The zygote is going to travel down the fallopian tube. It's going to undergo cell division, mitosis. And then the blastocyst is going to uh, travel to the uterus, this thick, hollow, muscular chamber. The corpus luteum which is the follicle that is now filled uh, with these yellow follicular cells, the corpus luteum is going to promote the production of progesterone. Progesterone is going to cause the thickening of the uterine wall and the development of the highly vascularized endometrium, which is going to allow for the implantation of the blastocyst. Most mammals, with the exception of the apes, have a breeding season which often results in a subsequent parturition window, a birthing period, that aligns with some environmental phenology that maximizes the probability of survival for the offspring. So for example, the elk are going to rut in the fall. This is followed by an approximately 250 day gestational period. And then the elk calves are going to hit the ground in late spring right when the green-up is occurring. So the brief period during which time females are receptive, the few days before and after ovulation, this is called estrus or heat. 
So most mammals are going to ovulate spontaneously as controlled by hormones, as we talked about in the last slide. But there are some species, maned wolves, island foxes, and bush dogs that are going to require copulation. They're going to require sex in order to induce ovulation. In desert rodents and montane voles, ovulation is actually induced by green up, so environmental factors, following rains or snowmelt. Many carnivores like wolves, uh, bears, they are monestrous, meaning they have just one uh, breeding cycle, one estrus cycle per year. Whereas other species like rodents and legomorphs, these are smaller bodied species with a much faster life tempo, they can have multiple uh, estrus cycles per year. So they're what we call polyestrous. Your text has an insert on the Big Bang breeders, like the Australian Dazzy Urid. Uh, the genus is Antichinus. But this is such an unusual species uh, that I want you to do more than just read the insert. I want you to put me on pause right now and please take the two minutes and seven seconds and watch the video that's embedded in Canvas that's entitled Mating to Death, the Tough Life of Antichinus. Implantation in the uterus usually occurs when the embryo is still a blastocyst, meaning it's composed of a mere 32 to 64 cells. So as previously mentioned, the blastocyst is going to implant into the endometrium, which is highly vascularized. Upon implantation, the blastocyst is going to differentiate into the embryo as well as the trophoblast. The trophoblast is then going to send down these finger-like projections which are going to merge with the female blood vessels in the endometrium and this merger is what's going to eventually form the placenta. The truly remarkable placenta is going to anchor the fetus to the uterus. And then perhaps most importantly, it's going to transport all of the nutrients that that fetus needs, so glucose, oxygen, from mother's circulatory system to that of the fetus. Further, it's going to receive all of the metabolites, all of the nitrogenous waste uh, from this fetus. And then lastly, the placenta is going to produce an entire suite of hormones that are going to regulate the organs of both mother and fetus. The crazy thing is that the mother's immune system doesn't reject the placenta and the embryo because after all the zygote is the product of sexual recombination. The zygote and the placenta uh, contain approximately 50% of dad's DNA. And you have to remember the primary function of the immune system is to seek out and identify foreign alien invaders and to attack. But it turns out that the placenta is integral in suppressing mom's immune response against it and the embryo. Which brings us to this week's primary literature summary. Um, this is actually a really amazing article. Uh, so it was published in 2018. And the researchers have highlighted the importance of endogenous retroviruses. An endogenous retrovirus is a virus that's inserted itself into the host genome but the host has actually co-opted uh, that DNA in regulating its own genes. 
So these endogenous retroviruses are in uh, Eutherian mammal DNA. And they're actually responsible for allowing the placenta to mediate cell-to-cell -cell fusion, suppress maternal immunity, and protect the fetus from exogenous viruses. So after COVID, viruses get such a bad rap, uh, but these retroviruses, they may have been crucial in the evolution of the eutherian placenta. Before moving on from the placenta, I do want to remind you that marsupials, the metatheria, they do indeed have a placenta. However, it differs because the marsupial placenta is derived from the yolk sac, whereas the eutherian placenta is derived from the extra embryonic membranes in the amniotic egg, the uh, corion and the allantois. So the, comparatively, the marsupial placenta is very inefficient. It's going to form a much weaker connection with the uterine wall because it doesn't have all of those extensive projections extending into the endometrium. Moving on to gestation, that's the time period between fertilization and parturition or birth. Gestation is going to vary dramatically across the major mammalian lineages from no intrauterine gestation in the egg laying monotremes to the very short period of gestation in the marsupials because as we've covered they've got that relatively inefficient placenta to the relatively long gestational period in the eutherian mammals or the placental mammals. So beyond taxonomic group, gestation is also highly correlated with body mass. So larger animals like elephants and elk, they're going to have longer gestational times than say rodents. Also, the degree of development that the young uh, is born with uh, is going to influence gestational times. So ungulates here on the right, their young are born relatively precocial, relatively well-developed. So they have a longer gestational period uh, than, say, primates. So primates are born relatively altricial, meaning underdeveloped, less developed. So they have uh, relative to their body mass a shorter gestational period. Next, I want to summarize some of the reproductive variations that we observe when we look across mammalian taxa. So the normal normal reproductive sequence, I guess I should say the reproductive sequence that's most often observed uh, and is exhibited by this primate goes like this. So it begins with spontaneous ovulation. The follicle bursts and it releases that ovum. We know that uh, spontaneous ovulation, ovulation is carefully coordinated uh, by the endocrine system, by the hormones. Following uh, the release of the ovum, we have copulation, which is the sexual act. Uh, this results in fertilization, which is the fusion of the male gamete, the sperm, with the female gamete, the ovum. Uh, following fertilization, the blastocyst is going to undergo uh, mitosis, cell division, it's going to travel down the fallopian tubes into the uterus where it is going to implant on the uterine wall, specifically on the endometrium. Okay, it's here that the fetus will develop in a period known as gestation. And then the offspring is born in parturition and then it enters into a period of uh, lactation where it receives milk as nourishment. So that's the most common sequence that we see in mammals. In the felids, like this bobcat here, uh, letter B, uh, it's slightly different. So uh, the felids have uh, induced 
ovulation. So the felids are going to require copulation first in order to uh, have that follicle burst and release that ovum. So uh, copulation, then ovulation, and then fertilization occurs in the fallopian tubes and the sequence remains the same. Implantation, gestation, parturition, and then lactation. And then we also observe uh, a couple of patterns where different lineages uh, have delays in this process. So the first one is uh, delayed ovulation or delayed fertilization, uh, like we see in some species of bats. We're going to talk about this in the next slide, uh, but in short, uh, some bat species will copulate and then the females will actually store the sperm. And then following seasonal hibernation, when they awaken, then the follicle bursts, then we have ovulation, uh, and then the uh, sperm become motile again, and uh, fertilization occurs. Uh, we also observed uh, cases of delayed implantation uh, in the ursids, uh, like this sun bear and my beloved black bears, and we'll come back to this. Uh, but essentially, the blastocyst is going to remain uh, in suspended animation inside of the uterus. There's a delay uh, before the blastocyst is implanted. With delayed fertilization or delayed ovulation, insectivorous bats will mate in the fall, and then they're going to store that emotile sperm until spring. When the females emerge from hibernation in spring, then their follicles will release the eggs, the sperm becomes motile, and fertilization occurs. So delayed fertilization or delayed ovulation. In numerous frugivorous bat species, fruit-eating bat species, fertilization occurs, the blastocyst implants, but then development occurs very, very slowly. So for example, in the Jamaican fruit-eating bat right here, the gestation length is seven months, which is very, very slow for an animal with such a small body mass because there is this delay in the development of the blastocyst. Black bears are a wonderful exemplar of delayed implantation. So in black bears, females are going to go into estrus in midsummer, during which time copulation occurs and fertilization. However, the blastocyst is going to remain in suspended animation within the uterus of the female until the hyperphagia period. The hyperphagia period, that occurs during the fall, and it's this critical period in the life cycle of bears, during which time bears have to accumulate enough fat to live on during their upcoming hibernation. And it's only after they've met their energetic demands, their individual inter energetic demands, that the blastocysts will implant. If the mast crop is poor, meaning acorn production is really poor in the Northeast, then those suspended blastocysts will actually abort and not implant. And this makes sense because if the female's in really poor nutritional condition, the cubs are unlikely uh, to be born. And if they are born, they're unlikely to survive because she's likely not to be able to make enough milk to support those offspring. Marsupials have independently evolved a similar trick to uh, delayed implantation called embryonic diapause. During embryonic diapause, the blastocyst is going to enter a state of dormancy, during which time cell division all but stops. 
So embryonic diapause is reported to occur in almost all kangaroos, wallabies, rat kangaroos, pygmy possums, feather tail gliders, and honey possums. What's so cool about this is that at a given time, a uh, red kangaroo, a female red kangaroo, like we see here bottom left, can simultaneously nourish three offspring at once. So she may have one weaned joey that runs at the heel of the mother and occasionally is going to suckle from an elongated teat outside of the pouch. The second young is a nursing pouched joey that's attached to another teat within her marsupium. And then finally, she'll have a tiny blastocyst uh, that is uh, in this state of embryonic diapause within one of the two uteri in uh, red kangaroo females. At the end of gestation, the adrenal glands in the fetus actually are going to secrete adrenocortical hormones like cortisol, which are going to initiate this whole hormonal cascade, which is going to induce parturition or birth. So next, the placenta is going to begin to secrete more estrogen and less progesterone, and then hormones called prostaglandins, which are going to initiate the contractions of the muscular uterus. As the baby's head presses against that cervix, the nerves, of course, are going to carry that impulse to mom's brain. A mom's brain is going to stimulate the pituitary gland to produce the hormone oxytocin. The oxytocin carried in the blood back to the uterine muscles and then the contractions are gonna start in earnest, which is going to further push that baby's head down and through the cervix, which is going to cause this positive feedback loop. The oxytocin is also going to stimulate the letdown of the milk so that it's available for that newborn infant. And then finally, there's a hormone called relaxin. It's produced by those uh, corpora lutea, the yellow bodies in the ovaries, which were once the follicles. Uh, it's going, they're going to produce relaxin, and those are going to soften the ligaments of mom's pelvis so that it can spread and allow for the passage of the fetus through the birth canal. The vagina dilates and then rhythmic contractions of the uterus gradually force that fetus through the vagina and to the outside world and the baby is born. If the amniotic sac is not ruptured during the birth process, then mother is going to tear that away from the young, allowing uh, those lungs uh, to begin to take in oxygen, allowing that newborn to breathe. And then mother is going to sever that umbilical cord and then consume that nutritious placenta. Two terms that I've previously mentioned, but I just want to take a moment and define those because they will show up on this week's assessment, wink, wink. Um, altricial young, altricial young are born relatively underdeveloped, less developed. Uh, so they're born hairless, uh, blind, meaning their eyes are not open. They're essentially helpless. So examples include these adorable baby rabbits here on the bottom left. Carnivores are often altricial, as well as rodents, like you see these altricial uh, mouse pups here. Precocial young are born relatively well developed. They're born fully haired, uh, their eyes are open, they're ready to get up and walk around shortly after birth. So examples of precocial young include the hares, many grazing animals, the ungulates like the zebra here, cetaceans, the dolphins and whales, hyraxes, some rodents and some primates. So if you think about some of these lineages, it kind of makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. If you're a zebra calf born on the Serengeti Plains with lions and leopards and cheetahs and hyenas, 
you need to move around relatively quickly. If you're a dolphin and you're born uh, into an aquatic environment, uh, you need to be able to swim relatively quickly so you can get up to the surface and take that first breath. Milk production by the mammary glands is the quintessential feature of the class mammalia and its namesake. So mammal comes from the Latin word mammus, which means breasts. Lactation is a crucial element in the life history of all mammals, be it monotremes, marsupials, or eutheria. Milk is an incredibly nutritious substance containing lots of fat and proteins like casein and whey, lactose, which is a milk sugar, salts, vitamins, Further, milk is going to support the growth of the microbiota in the offspring's intestines. This microbiota is an incredibly important mutualistic uh, relationship between mammals and microbes. The first product actually produced by the mammary glands following birth is called colostrum. Colostrum is a protein-rich fluid that's going to vector antibodies that's going to confer mom's immunity to her offspring. As you would predict, mammals living in harsh northern climates have milk that's very high in fat and protein to allow their offspring to accumulate insulative fat as quickly as possible so that they can thermoregulate. Whale and seal milk is comprised of between 40 and 61 percent fat. So that's about 12 times the fat content that's in whole cow's milk that you and I may drink. Uh, also, it's got 11 to 12 percent protein, which is four times higher than cow's milk. So uh, different properties of milk depending upon uh, what latitude these mammals are living at. As I mentioned at the beginning of this <laughs> admittedly very long lecture, uh, monotremes do not have true nipples. Instead, they're going to secrete milk through pores onto the skin, and then it's going to travel down tufts of hair on the platypus abdomen to be lapped up by young or in the pouch of the echidna. Marsupials have a circular arrangement of nipples within their pouch like we see on this gray short-tailed possum. The number of nipples on all mammals is going to vary among groups and it's related to mean litter size. Last slide. I really like this figure a lot. It's uh, figure 9.16 in your textbook. We've got two species of small mammals. The southern grasshopper mouse is a placental, and then the marsupial mouse on the bottom right. But you can really see the strategies of the marsupials relative to the placentals here. The marsupials have a relatively longer lactational period relative to the placentals, and the placentals have a relatively longer gestational period, which is in black on this bar graph. Same thing holds for large-bodied placentals versus marsupials. This is a uh, Thompson's gazelle. Uh, this is a wallaroo here. And you can see this really long lactational period in the wallaroo relative to the Thompson's gazelle. And then this long intrauterine uh, gestation period in the gazelle. And with that, a round of applause for you, a pat on the back. Um, I very much appreciate your time and your attention, and I hope you find these helpful. Thank you.